And we are back with author Jessica Moore. Uh, Jessica, I know you've talked about uh, Zora Neale Hurston as being a major influence. And and we we actually, I'm actually right now uh, interviewing you from Mobile, Alabama. And she actually wrote a fantastic book called Baccaroon, chronicling Africatown community uh, of our city right here. Just a little bit of in- interesting trivia here. Um, well, that's wonderful. I love that connection. And and uh, and just uh, last week we had Ben Rains on the show, and he was uh, he discovered the Clotilda, which was wow. the last slave ship, um, which was from Africatown. So. Of course. Small world in that sense. Um, Absolutely. So now doing uh, some research on you, I read that you were once a ghost writer of romance novels. What was that experience like? And and who is Norma Dauntless? (laughs) So um, after I finished my, in the States, you'd call it an MFA, um, I was sort of shopping my book around and working on it. And um, I had to do something in the meantime, but I didn't want to sort of throw myself into some in sort of some other whole career. I thought, well, I'll see if I can make a living by my pen. Um, and I found that actually you can find sort of ghostwriting gigs online. Um, and I thought I'm going to need a persona in order to really get into the character of this ghostwriter who writes outrageous plot lines. So I sort of invented a persona for myself who sports a pink kimono and one of those um, sort of big headbands and sort of swans around her apartment with a glass of champagne in her hand saying, darling, I've got to write this now. Um, So that was me. Um, And that only lasted a few months, which is probably a good thing because I was writing like 5,000 words a day, which is not sustainable. Um, But I think it was very good for me, actually, because it was it was a good um, bit of sort of craft training in making yourself write something that is uh, compulsively readable because the kind of books that I was ghostwriting, that was what you, you had to keep reading them. That was the whole point. So it was a fun anecdote and also a good bit of training. So let's talk about the, your debut novel, Keeper. Uh, it's finally hitting the bookshelves uh, in the new year. Tell us about the book. So the book is about a young woman called Katie Straw, who works in a women's shelter. And um, she's a young woman with a lot going for her. She's smart, she's educated, but something happens and uh, she dies and we don't know why. Um, And the circumstances around her death um, are explored partly through the perspective of the women in the women's shelter who she was working with. So it's a novel that takes place through multiple perspectives. And it's about these women each having a little piece of the puzzle of Katie's story and how that ultimately comes together. How did the idea for the novel start? I know that you've worked firsthand in the violence against women's sector. Mm. Was, was, was it in part based on that? Was it from somewhere else? It was, well, that was what was going around my head. And I, I wanted to write something based in a women's shelter because I thought it was really interesting to think about a bunch of people who were in the same situation or had ended up in the same situation thrown together who might be from drastically different backgrounds and circumstances and their own different perspectives on how they'd ended up there. So that was my starting point. And then I thought there needs to be something to sort of pull us through and often that is somebody dying. Um, a body turns up, we have a story. Um, so that was where that came from. Um, and then I also, there was a sort of piece which was uh, exploring the police's point of view. Um, and my sort of, that sort of arose from my concerns over the sort of failings that I had seen throughout the system. Um, and I wanted to explore, I suppose, the humanity of that and how that could come to be. And it's not necessarily people being malicious. It's not cruelty it's it's systems can sometimes fail and they can let people down um so those sort of three main strands came together and formed the novel at what point did you realize that you had a good story i think i felt that i had a story that was worth telling because i think it was almost um a sense that, that that I I had a piece of I had something that I needed to share in terms of my what I had learned about domestic violence, and I felt 
I didn't know whether it was a good story, but I knew I wanted to share that. I, I wanted to convey that message. And so I thought, well, I, I better make it a good story. Were you ever surprised by the story or the characters as you wrote it and as it came together? And I other... was sort of surprised by some of the of my experiences writing it. Mostly there's one particular character who um, is uh, the police officer. And I was surprised by how much I sympathized with him. Um, he makes some choices that I don't think are, are great, but I really went as far as I could into that character and tried to understand his humanity. And that was quite surprising to me that I ended up feeling quite fond of him, um, which I sort of forced myself to do. Um, but in terms of um, the plot and in particular the ending, the ending was in place from day one. I knew that there was a, a sort of critical point, you know, a, a climax that I would I had to work towards. And so that was always on the horizon. So we talked a little bit about it before. Um, you've worked firsthand in the violence against women's sector. What are the things that we as a Western society keep getting wrong in that sense? I think one thing that I saw people getting wrong again and again and again was that the reason that, I mean, domestic violence can happen to anyone and be perpetrated by anyone, but the, old, the overwhelming majority of victims, particularly victims of um, very serious violence and murder, are women. And there's often a story which is that the reason that these women might stay in this relationship is because they're sort of weak or they're masochistic or they, you know, aren't um, fully understanding of their own situation. And a lot of the time there is very concrete reasons why people would stay. And the, the, the biggest reason why a woman might stay is um, sort of illuminated by the statistic that the most dangerous time for a woman is the moment that she leaves. So a lot, a huge number of the homicides that go on to happen happen after the woman has left. So if she's just thinking about her safety, then there's a very good case for staying. And I think that's not well understood and it needs to be at the center of um, people's understanding of domestic violence. And what else would I say? I think it's just about, I think a big problem is the idea that there's a single image of what a victim looks like. A victim can be anyone. It's not a particular age, race, class. We do broadly know that most victims are female, but obviously there are male victims. Um, there, there can be domestic violence in LGBT relationships. There's no one single script of what that violence might look like. Do you see any solutions to those problems? And, and if you do, how do we get people on board with that? Well, I think a huge solution is money. Um, we do sort of know what's, what works, um, and it tends to be giving some, someone somewhere safe to go. Um, but that isn't necessarily the cheapest option. Um, I think in the long term, there's much to be said for educational solutions and teaching people what um, a safe and loving relationship looks like. Because unfortunately, um, a lot of people do inherit the idea that... Um, you know, that someone could hurt you and they still love you or that love hurts. Um, and I think until we sort of reprogram that script, this is going to keep happening over and over. So there's an immediate piece, which is funding and expertise. And then there's the long term solution, which I think, as with most things, can only be education. So um, let's get back to the book for a second. Where can our audience uh, order their copy of it and and well, let's go with that first, and then I want to ask you about what we can expect from you in the future. Sure. Um, well, wherever they normally buy books, um, I don't know. It, there would normally be a much easier answer to that, but obviously some things aren't open. So if your bookstore's open, then go there or order it from them online. Um, it's obviously available at Amazon um, and all good bookstores. Uh, what should we be able to expect from you in the future? You said you're working on another project now, huh? Mm, yes. Um, I describe myself to my editor as a sort of feminist hermit crab. 
So I like to go inside genres and sort of unpick their perspective on um, maybe women in their position in the world and figure out sort of what the cliches of a genre are and how I might reinvent them um, with a specific uh, perspective. So I'm working at the moment on a sort of contemporary novel, which, not to give too much away, is um, considering the aftermath of um, the Harvey Weinstein um, situation and uh, the state of Me Too and the choices that uh, women make. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know sometimes in these times it's difficult for people to be able to connect and, and we, you know, we normally shoot the show, you know, with a small audience and we shoot it at actually the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, but because of these times we are doing it this way. Um, but in some ways it gives us the opportunity to interview guests that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to get on the show. So we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.